Uh, good morning, dear students. My name is Farhan Mazhar, and today is the 4th of April, 2021. Right now, we are studying the subject of physics, and we are studying O-Levels Physics 5054. Today, we have set our heart to solve October-November 2010 2-1 paper. It's a theory paper. We call it paper 2, and in this session, in this video, we will be solving the section B of this paper the section a of this paper we will solve in another video you can find that video in my youtube channel if you go to the playlist you will find the section a of the these papers okay so uh, let's start this paper and the, the first question on your screen is this is the section b and a car has a gas filled shock absorber for each of its four wheels Figure 8.1 shows one of these shock absorbers. So here I have the shock absorber, here I have a cylinder, here we have the piston, and in that cylinder we have trapped gas, and here on the top we will have the body of the car. And we have such four shock absorbers in the car. And so he says the axle has... Uh, the axle has attached are attached to the cylinders. The body of the car is supported by the four pistons, which can move up and down inside the cylinders. Each piston has a cross-sectional area of 35 centimeters square. A driver of mass 70 kg gets into the car. Calculate the driver's weight. The weight is given by the formula W is equals to mg. You know the mass and you know the g value. You can easily calculate this. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. So W is equals to mg. So we know that uh, the, the m value is 70 and the g value is 10 newton per kg. You can multiply them and the answer will be 700 newton. Very easy to mark question. Hopefully you can get uh, full marks in this. So if you look at the marking scheme, the marking scheme, question number 8a, first part, and 700 Newton is the final answer. So I hope you will be able to get full marks in this. So let's move to the next part. Next part says the average increase in the pressure of the gas in the cylinders. The average increase, the pressure is equals to weight divided by area. But the, the technical thing here is that there were four shock absorber, absorbers, not a single shock absorber. Each shock absorber, uh, its piston has an area of 35 centimeters square. So four of them will have uh, four multiplied. Their area will be four multiplied 35. That will be something like 140. And let's see, I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. So weight is equals, to, uh, the pressure is equals to weight divided by area. That will be 700 Newton divided by four into 35. You just enter these values in the calculator and the final answer will be five Newton per centimeter square so very easily you can find the pressure to do mark question simple i let me check the marking scheme the marking scheme says uh five newton per centimeter square you see in this uh, in this question we have taken the area in centimeter squares that's why the unit for the pressure is newton per centimeter square one very important thing that you need to write the um uh, the unit in your answer so let's move to the next part. Next part is question number eight um, B first part. It says explain in detail how the molecules of the gas trapped inside the cylinder by the piston exert the pressure on the cylinder. Very simple question and a very famous question. It's the four mark question that the gas inside the cylinder, how that gas exerts pressure. You see the gas molecules are randomly moving. They are moving in all directions. And what happens, they are doing the random motion. They collide with the walls of the cylinder and they also collide with the piston. So when they collide with the piston and with the walls of the container, they exert force on the wall and the piston. So that force divided by the area, that will give you the pressure of the gas. So um, I have written this answer. Let me show you my answer. So here we go. 
molecules of gas are randomly moving they collide with walls of cylinder and piston molecules exert force on walls force per unit area is called pressure so let's check the marking scheme what the marking scheme says the marking scheme says molecules uh, there are four marks molecules atom particles move or collide one mark is for this molecules atom particles collide with the cylinder walls and one mark for this and exert force on the walls as they collide one mark for this and spread out effect of forces is is pressure or force per uh, uh, meter square so anything like what is the pressure like we defined at the end that the pressure will be force divided by area so it's a four mark question hopefully you will be able to write its answer so Next question, B, second part, is a two-mark question. The temperature of the trapped gas remains constant. So the temperature is constant and we are talking about gas. Explain why the pressure of the gas increases as the piston is moved further into the cylinder. When the push piston will move further into the cylinder, the volume of the gas will decrease. When the volume of the gas decreases, you know, and the temperature is constant, the, the pressure will increase. The pressure and the volume of the gas, if the temperature is kept constant, they are inversely proportional to each other. So when the when the when the piston will move further into the cylinder, the volume will decrease, the volume of the gas will decrease, and this will increase the pressure of the gas. Their question is the temperature of the trapped gas remains constant. Explain why the pressure of the gas increases as the piston is further and uh, moved further into the cylinder. You see, when the piston will move further into the cylinder the volume of the gas will decrease when the volume of the gas decreases and the number of molecules of the gas per unit volume that num that thing increases uh, the collision frequency of the gas molecules with the walls of the cylinder and the piston that increases and now because there are more number of molecules colliding on per unit per unit area so due to that also the because the that the pressure increases another very important thing is the molecules have to travel less distance to collide with the walls of the container that's why there will be more collisions uh, and the collision frequency will increase so uh, it's a, just a two mark question and i have written this answer and let me show you my answer and then we'll check the marking scheme as well when the volume of gas decreases, molecules per unit volume increases, molecules colliding per unit area also increases, collision frequency of the molecules with walls also increases, molecules have to cover less distance to collide with the walls of cylinder. That's the reason why the collision frequency has increased. So due to all these reasons, what happened, the pressure of the gas will increase. I have written this answer. Okay, now we have read my answer. Let's check the marking scheme. He says the molecules, atoms, particles, closer, denser, more in the given volume, one mark for this, and more collisions per unit area, and that's uh, meter per second, or per unit time. Don't, in, this word, in, in this whole answer, you know the temperature was constant, so you cannot say that the molecules have started uh, moving faster or their kinetic energy has increased. You cannot say these two words. Okay, so let's move to the next part. Mm, at the end of a long journey, the temperature of the trapped gas in the shock absorbers has increased substantially. The temperature of the trapped gas has increased. State what happens to the molecules of the trapped gas due to the temperature increase. You see that when the temperature rises, the molecules of the gas, they will start moving faster. Their kinetic energy will increase. So... Let me check my answer. I have written this answer. Due to the due to the temperature rise, molecules of the gas will travel faster and their kinetic energy will increase. Let's check the mark scheme. The marking scheme says one mark question. This is C one part. Speed of the molecules, atoms, particles increase and the kinetic energy will also increase. So one mark question. I hope you have understood. And let's move to the next part. Next part says, state and explain the effect of the increased temperature of the gas on the height of the car, car body above the road surface. You see, 
uh, when the uh, you know the temperature of the gas inside the pistons will increase and they will collide with the walls more frequently plus they will be uh, they will because they are moving faster that's why their collision frequency increases uh, plus they have more kinetic energy so when they will collide with the walls of the container they will exert more force on the collision so the pressure will increase initially so what will happen the the piston will move up the car body of the car will go higher and it will go higher higher <laughs> until the pressure becomes again as the pressure was initially so initially the pressure will increase but when the volume of the gas will increase the piston will move up and the body of the car will be lifted then this will rise up until the pressure is again the same as it was before so initially the pressure will increase but then the pressure will become same 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 okay this is the car body hires off the ground that's one mark for telling that the body of the car will move up and one mark is for telling that the collisions were violent or man it violent means when the particles of the gas will collide with the walls of the container they will exert more force collisions more violent or gas in the cylinder expands the gas will expand its volume will increase fewer collisions of molecules atom particles needed or pressure rises initially initially the pressure will obviously rise but when the car will move up the piston will move up then again the pressure will become the same as it was before so initially there will be a rise in the pressure it's a three mark question hopefully you are able to write this answer okay so we are moving to the next question the next question is question number nine on your screen figure 9.1 shows a young boy lying on uh, his back on the bottom of a swimming pool he's he, he is holding his breath and his eyes are open, a red light is positioned on the ground at the queue. At first, the boy's head is touching the pool wall. He notices that as he slides away from the pool wall, his eyes reaches a point P where he first sees the light at Q. Figure 9.1 shows the boy in this position. So this boy here is now able to see this light. So you see the light is traveling here and then entering into the water and he is going into the eyes of the boy. So uh, we will uh, look at the first question on the figure 9.1. Let me reduce the size so you can see, understand the whole thing. <clears throat> the qu question number A, 9A first part is on the figure 9.1, draw the ray of light traveling from the Q to P Mark the critical angle for the light in the water and label it C. So question number two, the critical angle, you know, it's always in the dense medium. I've done this uh, on a paper. And so this is the previous answer. The gas molecules will exert more force on the walls. Pressure of the gas will rise car body will rise and, and the end pressure will come back to original value. So uh, let me show you this and, okay. So here you can see that I have drawn a light, blue colored light ray. And from the eyes I started and I, I touch it this point and from here I draw a blue line till point Q. Here I have drawn a normal, this angle will be of 90 degree this angle of incidence is equal to the critical angle. This angle of incidence between the normal and this ray, that's the critical angle. And you can understand it's like the process of total internal reflection, you know. The, when the angle of incidence in the dense medium, which is water, is equal to the critical angle, the angle of refraction in the rare medium is of 90 degrees. So hopefully you can understand this. You remember that article. So this is how you do it. Let me check the answer. It says uh, horizontal ray from Q to pool edge and onto B from the corner critical angle mark C or obvious. So it's a two mark question. Okay, so we are moving to the next part. The next part is, he says, 
that uh, explain why the boy is unable to see the red light at Q when his eyes is closer to the pool. If this boy will move closer to this pool, he will not be able to see this red light. What is the reason? And the answer is simple, but to understand actually what happened here. For boy to see Q, angle of the incidence in the air must be 90 degree. For angle of incidence of 90 degree in the air, angle of refraction in the water cannot be less than critical angle. You see this process which is happening uh, here, the process which is happening here. And you know, there is a law, we call it the principle of reversibility. You know, a law which we call the principle of reversibility. The path of the light, the light came by this path. So the same light can go back by this path. So the light, if the light comes by a single path, on the same path, the light can go back. That is called the principle of reversibility. And, you know, what is happening here, this is the is this very famous example. When the angle of incidence is equal to the critical angle in the dense medium, the angle of refraction in the rare medium, in this case it's air, will be of 90 degrees. If the light is coming from Q, which is it's coming from Q, and this angle 90, the angle of incidence, the angle of refraction in the, in the dense medium cannot be less than critical angle. If it will be less than critical angle, this, this light ray will not make a 90 degree angle here. Okay. So the, let me read my wording. And then I will show you how this is, uh, how the answer is written. You see, for a boy to see Q, angle of incidence in air. Now we are considering that the light is coming from the Q. So the angle of incidence in air must be 90 degree. That is a must. For angle of incidence of 90 degree in air, angle of refraction in the water cannot be less than critical angle. <clears throat> when in the rare medium, the angle of incidence is 90 degree, the angle of refraction in the dense medium will be critical angle. If you make the critical uh, the angle of refraction, if the boy moves near to the wall of the pool, the angle of refraction will become less than critical angle, then the angle of incidence cannot be 90. If the angle of incidence will be not 90, the light will be not coming from the point Q. A little tricky question and difficult to answer and especially difficult to understand. So let's check the, check the marking scheme for angle of incidence equals to 90 degree or a horizontal ray. One mark for this and angle in water equals cannot be less than the critical angle. The answer is simple, but to understand actually what we are talking about is a little difficult. I've tried my best to explain it to you. Hopefully it's clear. Okay, so the next question is, uh, this is question B. This is question number 9A and it's third part. And it says uh, the critical angle the critical angle is 49. Calculate the refractive index of the water. You know, it's a very, very famous formula. N is equal to 1 divided by sine C. So N stands for the refractive index and sine C, C stands for the critical angle. So if I know the critical angle, I can very easily find out the, the refractive index. N value, I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. And here we go. So n is equals to 1 by sine c, n is equals to 1 by sine 49. In the statement of the question, they have told us that the critical angle is 49. So n is equal to 1 divided by 0 0.7547. So n is equal to 1.325. So n is equals to 1.325. Very simple question. Easy. Easy numerical. So let's check the marking scheme. What the marking scheme says 1.32. 501. So n is equal to sine c. 1 divided by sine c. So 1 divided by sine 49. And because the critical angle value is 49, it is given in the statement of the question. So uh, let's move to the next part. And it says uh, the red light is now replaced with the blue light. State the effect of this 
on the wavelength of the light in the air you know the the wavelength of the blue light is more uh, the red has more wavelength the blue's wavelength will be less the wavelength of the blue is less than the wavelength of the red if you remember that code word of the colors roy g biv r o y g b i v roy g biv red orange yellow green blue indigo violet when you go down in this order the frequency increases and the wavelength decreases so blue will have a smaller wavelength as compared to the red so let's check the marking scheme when this says decrease the blue will have less wavelength very simple question and let's move to the next part it's b part and let me reduce the size and maybe you are able to see it a small, very brightly illuminated display is located at the back of a projector. The projector lens produces an inverted and magnified image of the display on a white classroom wall. Figure 9.2 is a scale diagram showing the position and size of both the display and the image on the wall. R is a point on the display. So here we have the object and here we have its image. And in this diagram, you know, one centimeter represents 12 centimeter. And on this diagram, let me show you, make it bigger so you can understand it properly. And you see each centimeter is equal to 12 centimeter. That's the scale of the diagram. And here with the small five squares, five small squares are equal to one centimeter actually. So it's a normal graph which we use in the O levels. And then the question is, uh, the image is inverted and magnified. State to other properties of this image and this question. The image with the help of the projector is a real image. It's a magnified image. It's an upright image. It's, uh, but the brightness of the image will be less as compared to the object, okay? So the blue light will have smaller wavelength as compared to the red light. That's the, was the previous question. The two properties, the image is real and the image will be less bright as compared to the, to the object. So let's move to the next part. In the next part, he says, uh, we will check this parking scheme later. Okay. So third part, uh, second part is on the figure 9.2, draw the straight line ray from r to the image one mark is for this the third part is on the figure 9.2 draw a vertical line representing the lens and label label it l and the fourth part is the second ray r from r to the image passes through a focal point principal focus of the lens on the figure 9.2 draw this ray and use it to mark this focal point label this focal point as f Determine the focal length of the lens. Let me go to the, my work. I've done this, you see. Uh, let me increase the size so you can see it clearly. So first thing was, he said, join the top of the R with the top of the image. I have done this with the red light. This, if you remember how the image is located in the lenses, you should remember this is that ray which passes through the optical center of the lens and goes undeviated. This red light is showing that ray. So where it crosses the principal axis, I think this will be the center of the lens. So with this blue color, I have drawn this lens and you are supposed to label it as L. With here, you need to write L. So, and then he says, then in the second part, he said, uh, third part, sorry, he said that the ray will start another ray and that, I will, I will start from the head of the object. I will move it, the green light I'm talking about. I will move it parallel to the principal axis when it touches the lens. From there, I will join it with the top of the image, this green line. Okay, so where it cut the principal axis, there you will have the principal focus. So at this point where it cuts the principal axis, this green line, here I will put a dot or a mark here and I will write F. Then in the fourth part, they said, uh, find or determine the focal length of this lens. 
So because this is the principal focus, this point is the principal focus, and this is the optical center. And we know that the distance between the principal focus and the optical center of the lens, that is called the focal length. So I can count from here. I can see this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, I think eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So these are eight small squares. Eight small squares mean uh, 1.4. Sorry, uh, eight small squares mean 1.6 or let me count it again. Why am 1.1234567 or maybe 9 so 5 maybe it's 1.6 cm i think or 1. Point, uh, i i counted I, when i was working i thought it's 1.8 but right now it's 1.6 it, it does not matter if you take let's say you take it as 1.6 so you multiply it because one centimeter was representing 12 centimeters, you multiply it with the 12 and the answer will be 19.2. But I think this is which was 1.8. When you count it, it will be 1.8 and you multiply it with the 12 and it will be 21.6 centimeters. You can count it. Let me check first the marking scheme, then we will see what is the so the answer, whether you take it as 1.6 or 1.8, uh, the answer is in the range. The answer should be from 19 to 23 centimeter. My answer is 21 point something. And I think that will be good. So I hope you have understood that how I have found the focal length. So you see, if you count those small squares between the optical center and the principal focus, uh, when I did the, oh, I did the paperwork, I thought it's 1.8. So you multiply 1.8 with the with the 12, 1.8 centimeter, I mean. So let's move to the next part. So we are done with the fourth part. Now we go to the, and this is the question number uh, part B and it's fifth part, we are done. Okay, so we are moving to the next part. This is the question number 10, an atom of phosphorus, chemical symbol P is composed of 15 electrons, 17 neutrons, and 15 protons. So for this atom state, the proton number, the proton number is simply 15. Then he says the nucleon number or mass number, the mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So there are 15 protons and there are 17 neutrons. So it will be 15 plus 17, and I think it will be 32. This phosphorus atom is radioactive as it decays to an atom of sulfur, chemical symbol S. It emits a beta particle symbol B. Write a nuclear equation for this decay. So let me show you my work. I've done this work and uh, let me show it. So let's increase the size. So see, the proton number is 15. The nucleon number is 15 plus 17, 32. And the next part is, he said they write that equation. So we will have phosphorus 15, 32, and a beta particle is given out, and the daughter nucleus will be sulfur. You know, whenever a beta decay happens, whenever a beta particle is given out, it's a thumb rule. Remember this thing, whenever a beta particle is given out, the, the atomic number or the proton number of the daughter nucleus is one more than the proton number of the parent nucleus. And the mass number or the, uh, the mass number or the nucleon number of the daughter nucleus is the same, same as that of the parent nucleus. So that's why uh, we have it sulfur 1632 is produced. And on the bottom of the beta, we write minus one and on top of the beta, we write zero. So this is beta decay and this is the coin of the beta. And uh, then he says, uh, what is the beta particle? Beta particles are like electrons with negative charge on them. It is emitted from decaying nucleus. When a nucleus is decaying, radiation is emitted, then the beta particles are given out from the nucleus. The question was, explain what is meant by a beta particle. I have read my answer. So let's check the marking scheme for all these parts. and. Uh, he says uh, straight, 
Okay, so we are done with this part. Okay, so here we go. B first part, you can see he's talking about the equation. So I have written this, that, that equation is perfectly good. So electrons, the beta particle electron, there's a high speed run from nucleus for causes ionization. They're coming out of the nucleus when it's the case happening. So B, you can check out the marking scheme for the first part, second part, third part. Okay, so let's move to the next part. It says a sample of radioactive material contains many of these phosphorus atoms. Describe an experiment to investigate whether the sample emits a beta particle a diagram only beta particles. We have to prove that only beta particles are given out. A diagram may be included. So you see very simple question. I, what I will do for the diagram, I will show a GM tube and in front of that GM tube, I will put a sample. The sample should be in the lead box and the lead box opening should be towards the detector, GM tube. The procedure is very simple, but you do Without sample, you take a reading with the GM tube. That reading is called the background radiation. Just note it down that how much is the background radiation. And then we take the sample and we put a, the beta, uh, the detector GM tube in front of it. And we note down the reading. That's the reading of the sample. And then what you will do, you will put a paper between the detector and the sample. You, when you put a paper between them and you will observe, there will be no change in the reading. You see, when I put a paper between the sample and the detector and there is no change in the re reading uh, on the detector, it means that there are no alpha particles present. Because if alpha particles are present, they will be stopped by the paper and they cannot penetrate through the paper. So they will be stopped and there will be a change in the reading. So, but in this case, when you will put paper between the detector and the sample, the reading will be unchanged. It, this shows that uh, the alpha particles are not there. Then remove that paper and put a five millimeter thick aluminum foil between the sample and the detector. And what you will observe that the reading will drop and it will drop down to the background radiation. The reading on the, on the GM tube, that will drop down to the uh, background radiation. This means, this means that uh, there are beta particles because the beta particles they cannot penetrate through five millimeter thick aluminum foil. This means the beta particles are there and they have been stopped, and that's why the reading on the GM tube has dropped. And because it has dropped down to the background radiation, this means the gamma rays are not there. Because if the gamma rays are present, they can easily penetrate through the aluminum foil and they would reach the detector and the detector will show reading more than the background radiation. But in this case, the, the, when you put a five millimeter thick aluminum foil, the detector has started showing the background radiation only, which means that the radiation has been stopped by the five millimeter thick aluminum foil. And this is possible only because the beta particles, they will not they will not be able to penetrate through the aluminum foil. But if the gamma was present, it would have passed, it would have penetrated through the aluminum foil and there should have been a reading greater than the, re the background radiation. It's a four mark question. Let me show you my answer. I think, uh, okay, so here we go. Uh, Let me show you. Question number 10, B, third part. As you see in the diagram, I have shown a diagram of a GM tube and there is a lead box and in the lead box, I have a sample and the radiation is shown by red color and that is going towards the GM tube. So, and dotted line means I can put some, uh, uh, I can put a paper here, I can put a, Aluminum foil between the GM tube and detector. The procedure I have written, let me read it. Use the GM tube and note what is bag, background radiation. Put sample in front of the GM tube just few centimeters away 
note the reading due to the sample so that will be the reading of the sample put a paper between sample and gmq there will be no change in the reading on the gmq it means no alpha particles then put 5 mm thick aluminum sheet in place of paper reading on the gm tube will drop to the background radiation reading it means the beta particles are present and no gamma rays are there it's a four mark question this is how i wrote the answer let us check the marking scheme what the marking scheme says the marking scheme says that uh, four marks one mark is for saying that the record may have the background radiation or count radiation sample near named detector we told the name of the detector gm tube interpose or put a paper card less than 5 cm air and no change in the reading there was no change in the reading interpose 2 mm to 220 mm of uh, aluminum and reading will go down to the background so points may be made on a diagram other matters mark and along and along this line so i hope you have understood it's a four mark question you can stop the video here let me increase the size so you can if you want to write this answer which i have written so you can stop the video and note it down that what the what the uh, what is uh, so again i think that we are having some problem with the internet and let me check because the the screen on the display that's not changing unfortunately it's very bad my internet is is breathing so we had a problem so uh, maybe this is corrected let me check yeah now it's good so this is uh, you know i am in pakistan and we have the internet here it has the uh, speed is not that good and sometimes during making the videos is normally happen i'm used to it and the internet goes up and down so we have a problem so hopefully you also understand this is this is the reality of the life so the on your screen you can see you can stop the video and you can do this you can write down this answer it's a four mark answer you should never forget these wordings so okay so let's go to the next part and Let's see what happens. Okay, next is this isotope. Uh, this isotope of phosphorus has a radioactive half life of fourteen. Uh, its half life is fourteen point three days. The question is, what is meant by half life? So two marks definition, a very very famous question. Uh, explain what is meant by radioactive uh, active. Half life. I have written this answer. Let me show you my answer. And it says, average time duration in which half of a radioactive sample decays. Average time duration in which half of a radioactive sample decays. It's a very simple definition. Never forget this is a two mark definition. Let's check what the marking scheme says. The time for some measurable quantity to half uh, number of atoms, number of nuclei, activity count or rate. So you can use any name. So I use the term atoms. They will decay to half. Half of them will be decayed. So the next question on your screen is question number eleven and C and its second part. It says that uh, a solution containing such phosphorus atom atoms is used in a medical procedure when it is prepared. The solution has an activity of fourteen hundred counts per second. The solution cannot be used when its activity falls below thirty-five hundred. Uh, sorry, three hundred and fifty uh, counts per second. 
and calculate the maximum time between preparing and using the solution. So again, uh, there is some problem. And so my uh, screen, which I'm sharing, has stuck. And let me stop it preparing. OK, so again, let's share. The internet is posing problem. We are again sharing. So it says, uh, yeah, it, uh, the screen was stuck here, but uh, I have read the next question. The next question is a solution containing such phosphorus atoms in is used in a medical procedure. When it is prepared, the solution has an activity of 1400 counts per second. The solution cannot be used when its activity falls below 35, sorry, 350 counts per second. Calculate the maximum time between preparing and using the solution. So uh, I know the half-life. The half-life uh, is 14.3 days. If you look at the question. OK, the half-life is 14.3 days. So calculate the maximum time. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. And this is how I have done. So you see that at the start, I always do the half-life questions uh, in this manner. And uh, you know, uh, again, the video is stuck. Let me back, stop sharing, and then again share. So the internet is posing a big issue. I don't know whether this sound is coming clear or not, but I will see. I will check the. Okay, so again, so here is the question, I think. So this question we have already done. Let me show you my work. And so this is zero days uh, at this at the start of the observation. The the count rate is fourteen hundred. So when one half life has passed, fourteen point three days have passed. The 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 count rate will become half. So it will be seven hundred. When another half life will have passed. So it means 28.6 days have passed, basically. So 17, 700 will become half, and it will become 350. So after 28.6 days, the count rate will become 350. And they said when the count rate will be dropped to 350, the solution uh, will become useless. So the total time taken will be 28.6 days. So let me show you the marking scheme and the marking scheme is 28.6 days. So I'm really sorry but because of the internet, uh, you know, and uh, the whole thing was going up and down. And because the recording was on, but the screen sharing uh, that was stopped because I'm doing this recording on the internet. So this happens normally. It's all right. So uh, my dear students, I'm done with this paper. Today we have done physics 5054 to 1 section B during this uh, recording of this lecture because we are recording it online. And there was some problem with the internet. Hopefully you can excuse me for, uh, for forgive me for this internet issue. This is not in my control. And I've tried my best to, um, you know, to clear the concepts. Hopefully, the concepts are clear to you and you can uh, perform well in your physics. The section A of this paper, we will do in another session. But in this session, we have only done the section, section B of this paper. So everybody, thank you very much and have a good day and 